Welcome to the Weekend Sports Cars podcast from an echoey hotel room in, well, the outskirts of, outskirts of Barcelona as we uh, see the end of the LMS race weekend uh, behind us and with the FIWC prologue beginning to get underway with track action tomorrow. Um, I'm Graham Goodwin with the Marshall Pro podcast together with uh, Stephen Kilby. Before we get into that, of course, we say our regular thank yous and those thank yous go to those good people at Cooper Tyres. Um, for their long-term backing of the Marshall Brook podcast and as well to the fabulous people at the Justice Brothers for their backing of the Weekend Sports Cars and other great stuff from Marshall Brook. Uh, Marshall, we hoped, was going to be with us this week. Uh, we're going to do this, get this one through um, pretty fast and furiously uh, in what's been, it has to be said, Stephen Kilby, a gruelling weekend schedule between the LMS set-up days for the WEC's prologue and then two days of track action in sweltering heat here in Spain. Mm. Yeah, it was like it was like the Super Sebring earlier in the year, but hotter in a way. Uh, it was just it's just it's hard when you've got those condensed schedules. Like a three day meeting pushed into two days. It went all of us were on our toes, weren't we, in the press room? We were a couple of days of good racing. Uh, perhaps not the best race we've seen in the LMS recent history, but uh, engaging stuff. Loads and loads of news kicking around around LMS moving forward. Uh, about the Asian Le Mans series with some exciting new entries to come, but in particular um, with some news today, which clearly has missed uh, the question uh, round for the weekend sports cars to do with a major set of changes, which I have to say we knew about. We were asked to keep quiet. We did about changes in equivalence of technology, which could see a distinct difference in the balance of power in LMP1, and albeit a much reduced LMP1 class. Six cars here at the test, but we expect only five of those cars for the full W season, starting uh, with the first race on the 1st of September at Silverstone. Two Toyotas, again, news today, uh, fairly heavy revisions to those cars. Uh, two Ginetta ARs with Team l and and we spent much of our day with that team today. Stephen, and uh, an interesting group of drivers that are being gathered to do two days of uh, on-track testing, 16 hours of uh, track time over the next two days. And whilst we have two rebellions uh, with the Gibson engine here, uh, only one of those cars I think we're going to see for much of the season, perhaps uh, Spa and the uh, Le Mans 24 hours for the second car, but I don't think we're going to see it before then. Is it too little too late with the changes in EOT? Uh, it's going to mean that the, the two parts, if you like, of that balancing act between or non-balancing act between the hybrid cars and the remainder of the cars that being pace on track and also uh, effectively a disparity of time in the pits the pit stop time completely gone now so it will mean that there'll be the same number of regular pit stops whether or not it's a non-hybrid uh, privateer car or whether or not it's a hybrid Toyota uh, so that one lap advantage on fuel mileage is gone. Um, the second part of it is that there's also this aspect of the uh, the rule set that was designed to advertise, if you like, the fact that the, the totas were much more efficient on fuel, to doing, well, that plus one lap, but uh, with, broadly speaking, half the fuel. That's gone too, and in fact, uh, the fuel fill for the non-hybrids will be one second quicker than the Toyotas. That, to accommodate the fact, because the Toyotas have got the start on full electric, they save about a second, a second and a half every time they start the car. What that means is, at Le Mans, for instance, the performance disparity, the on-track disparity, with those measures alone, roughly in half. Then you get into the other parts, which is success ballast for the season already. Toyota are going to be carrying 14 kilos more um, as part of the equivalent technology that's been judged for them for this test. Uh, that, with success on track, could mean a maximum of 45 kilos for a successful car, successful team, as the championship progresses. Getting to the stage, as the technology in the non-hybrids matures, as the teams understand more, as they get to be more reliable, getting to the stage where that could start to get quite interesting beyond single lap pace. We'll know a bit more, but probably not all of it, by the time we've got to the end of track action here in Barcelona. 
Mm, yeah, I think it's it, it was interesting earlier. I thought when we sat down with Lawrence Tomlinson, the guy behind the the Janetta, the Team L&T program, that's here, and he was sitting there doing the maths, wasn't he? Trying he was. to trying to work out just how much time that they would gain from things like the pit, the pit stop regulations changing and being more equal over the course of the Le Mans twenty four hours. And I think it's safe to say he's pretty encouraged, isn't he? Because he's one of many people in the paddock who have been campaigning for this all to get a bit more equal. And I think that's certainly a an encouraging sign. It is, and at least one person who's hosted the weekend sports cars has been pretty actively campaigning for it as well. I'm who's delighted. That? <laughs> Might be me. Um, and you know, I've seen some correspondence from multiple people involved in the business. I think this is going to be welcomed by the teams, uh, with possibly one exception. Although I'm not absolutely convinced that Toto actually don't want the competition at this point. Mm. But also, I think it, it should be and will be um, welcomed by the, the fan base. Other good news beginning to emerge about uh, the show, if you like. There'll be more news to come of this. But I think if you're coming along to an FIWC race meeting this year, you can expect a big of a bit of an uptick in terms of what's going to be accessible to you. It's already pretty good. But more news about uh, some things that teams, team, us are working on uh, that are going to massively increase the opportunities for fans to get very close to the action uh, at FIWC meetings. And one other little bit of a snippet, and there's a bit of an advance depending on when Marshall gets to post this, uh, this edition of Weekend Sports Cars, very busy at the moment, of course, moving home to accommodate himself and his good lady wife, and uh, good luck with all of that, uh, Marshall, um, is the the sole remaining current prospect reality of a two-car LMP1 team is Team LNT, and I've been sitting in on a number of things that Lawrence Tomlinson's been doing today, including some stuff you'll read on dailysportscarracer.com. Um, is he going to enter the cars to, uh, for the full uh, season, the two cars? He's got every intention of doing so and he's working like hell to get those prospects together. And one of the things that motivates him, as he said on the record more than once today, is he'd like three cars at Le Mans. He would like three Ginetta ARs at Le Mans with a proper team of pros and at least one, at least one of those cars. And if you've been reading the material that Stephen and I have been putting out today here from the circuit to Catalonia, you'll see there is a very interesting array of drivers uh, that are slated to actually run in those cars. Uh, you may have read elsewhere with certainty or otherwise that others are in the mix. That's absolutely true, but no deals yet signed. That will come in the days and the short weeks that come. For now, we get to the stage where we're not racing, but testing and testing quickly tomorrow. And right now is the time where we, sw- we switch effortlessly into your questions mm. and let's start off with some IMSA shall we we're fresh from the weekend at Lime Rock if we have to yes and we will kick things off with Ryan Terpstra who says so Ben Keating had some words about the 57 Ac- Acura and other things what's your take uh, saw a bit of the action I've read a bit of the coverage and Ben's words and a little bit of the response to those I think you can't have it both ways really here can you which is after Le Mans and the, let's face it, epochly crushing disappointment that that must have been for Ben Keating. Uh, he was beyond classy. He was beyond classy in his social media response. He was beyond classy when, uh, you know, uh, I and others spoke to him directly about that, as Marshall most certainly did. He was beyond classy in terms of the more long form response he gave to the disappointment of having a Le Mans win taken away from him for legitimate reasons that that, that was taken away. Uh, the, the conduct of the race leading up to that point, less less convinced, was completely straight. But he was an absolutely classy uh, dude about that and absolutely worthy of the moniker Gentleman Racer. That's his character. If he is as annoyed as he clearly was by the tactics um, of the Acura NSX drivers, then you've got to say he's probably thought about that long and hard before he's decided whether or not to throw down the dice and say, that's not right. Um, he's been in the, the, the briefing meetings. He'll have been in with race director and stewards if that was required here. I'm sure that he'll have been in direct contact with team and drivers concerned. And I have to say that if he felt it was worth going public with his feelings on that one, the reality here is he's not changed in character, has he? from uh, the guy that was 
disappointed post Le Mans, you tend to think he's got a pretty good filter for these things, and the likelihood is he may well actually have a point. Mm. We had a diff, a, a very similar situation this weekend or this past weekend at um, Barcelona f- in during the Le Mans Cup race, didn't we? Involving the Beach DNA MR. We did. Vantage, which was held up by a P3 car. We did. It was the, here's the remarkable kind of um, parity here between them. That was a LMP3 car capable of times in about the 144s to 145s. Indeed, I've seen data that this particular car um, in the laps to c- catch and pass two cars in fifth and fourth position. Uh, an AMG Mercedes and, if you're right, a Beach Street Aston Martin catching the third place. Ferrari um, was averaging about 145.5. The second that car passed the fourth place car, um, its average lap time of the next 10 laps went up three seconds. Now, there's two, um, there's two possible answers about that one. He wasn't under any really pressure uh, from ahead. He wasn't balked by the car ahead. And yes, by the way, we're talking about the spirit of race, Ligier, uh, Michele Rucolo and the car ahead was the Lusic Racing car, uh, the third place car in, L- in GT3, both operated by the same team, that being AF Corsa. Um, and am I directly accusing that car of operating rear gunner policy? I'm completely accusing him of doing it. It was absolutely blatant. Only two explanations for that. One is that it was a team... Um, well, either he decided to do it or it was a team instruction or request to do it. The second issue, possibly, is that he had an issue in that car. If he had an issue to the degree where that car was three seconds a lap slower, he should not have been getting away with a class battle. He should have been out of that and dealing with his issues with the LMP3 cars and not the GTs. It irritated me to watch it. It irritated me to try to describe it to the viewers that we talked to. And I have zero doubt that if you are Ben Keating... Having had, it has to be said, a mare of a season in IMSA this year, that when you can see the potential for a good result, to feel as if someone is actively acting against those interests, um, not because it's to do with their race, because it's to do with your race against their teammates, you know, he's perfectly uh, right and correct to express himself if that's what he thinks. If he's crossed a line, there's a process to deal with that. It doesn't appear to have been put in place yet. Mm. Carrying on now, we've got Right Turn Lover, who says, in honour of Gan- the Ganassi Ford's win at Lime Rock, what's the most stunning slash cunning strategy play that you remember? There's so many. Um, and I'm just trying, I mean, we've seen race uh, strategies that have actually been fundamental in affecting um, really major race wins. Those of you that are familiar with the, the two fantastic uh, films, I keep forgetting the name of the films, for Audi at Le Mans. Oh, Truth in 24. Truth in 24, and the very first one there, which we're talking about tyre strategy. You know, these are the things that define whether or not you know, a team can attack for a win or defend a lead in adversity. But it's for me, you'll have heard me on the weekend sports cars before now, go on about various races. We've got one coming up this part 24 hours. I know we've got some questions later about that, where strategy has taken out the equation because regulation takes precedence. It's nonsense. It takes away something fundamental to what endurance racing always has been, which is, yes, it's about awesome drivers on track, but it's about awesome people on the pit wall. It's about awesome people when that uh, car hits the pit lane, turning that car around as quickly as possible. If you remove those elements, you mess with the fundamentals of endurance racing. And for me, it's when you make that call to say, stay on those tyres, you can make this. And the driver is then left to do what drivers do, which is to assess the risk of, you know, their allotted pace, corner by corner, sector by sector, lap by lap, hour by hour. Hearing back from those same people on the pit wall, whether or not they're maintaining a gap or they're managing a gap uh, to the end of that race. To me, that's what really matters about sports car racing. It is great to see people with thundering, fundamental pace, but there is something much better in my mind about somebody who's able to employ every single aspect of the spectrum in endurance racing, to use the brains of the people on the pit wall, to put faith in his pit crew or her pit crew, to turn their car around quickly, 
when maybe you've got that call to make. You don't have to make that pit stop, but you tr- choose to make that pit stop to take those tyres, take that fuel, to give yourself that edge, and you put your trust in the your guys to turn the car around without fault. Can I actually put my finger on a particular moment when that has tended to happen? It tends to be when you've got a car that perhaps isn't in rude health, or you are found yourself through luck and good judgment and talent ahead of a car that is quicker. Um, I don't tend to rate these as being those moments when someone's made a call on tyres in a drying race or a race that's getting a bit wetter. They are fun, massive fun, when you see the difference between it's not tense anymore, it's that guy is seven seconds a lap quicker, and all of a sudden it's absolutely amazing. But, you know, we have seen those instances, Stephen, where late, deep, deep into a race that someone's still got tyres. They've taken the risk and taken that extra 20 seconds that it's taken to change maybe two tyres, maybe all four. And then you've got to chase in the last five, six, seven minutes, maybe three, four laps. And then we've got real excitement. That's when when it gets the crowd on their feet. It's when it gets the press room on its, its feet. And I can tell you right now, it gets the TV commentary crew on their feet as well. Mm. We actually saw a pretty good strategy call over the weekend in the LMS race from G-Drive Racing. They were on Dunlops, and I believe all the people around them at the start of the race were on Michelins. And they were the only team around them that decided to double stint the tyres at the first stop despite the fact that the temperatures track side were oh, ludicrous it was, yeah. they sent Russian off out without changing tyres everyone else had changed them he was in the lead and I thought he was going to get swallowed up towards the end which of he stint. did at Paul Rickard mm, but he fended them off didn't he and, the, and that ultimately gave him the platform to build that lead and win them that race and it worked well, it was an treat. they thrashed the field I mean it's unusual before our race to see any team in let's face it what we've heard a lot in recent uh, days in the last week or so with the United Autosports changing um, their their, uh, their chassis from a Legion to an Orica. Lots of people making the the, uh, the point that it feels a bit like a spec class. In very many ways it is a spec class. We've got a choice of chassis but there is one predominant chassis at the moment. It is the same engine. There is a choice of tyres. In those circumstances to come home in a field as deep and as competitive as this by a full lap on pace is pretty remarkable stuff. Mm. You have to say as well that um, in the, it's, it's interesting because it was Ganassi at one last weekend at Lime Rock. Uh, their call that won on the race, the first ever win for the Ford GT at Laguna Seca, from Brightly, was a pretty big fuel oh, yeah. run. It was, it was a really impressive... It was, actually, it was, it was, it was Richard Westbrook. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? He had a yeah. fuel save run towards the end of the race at Lime Rock, uh, Laguna, wasn't it? Yeah. And that was a pretty pretty stunning display of driving. That, you know what? You, you, you nailed it in terms of the one that's, uh, that I guess in, in recent living memory... Um, was the one that stood out. It was a breakthrough win. It was a win with an extraordinary uh, performance and strategy attached to it. It was massively risky. And this is the thing about, you know, great strategy involves risk. And it's how well you can keep to what is a very edgy plan with a pot of gold at the end of that checker flag lap. And isn't it great when it actually happens like that? It's perfect. It's great to watch, and I'm sure for the people involved, it's even greater. We'll carry on now with Josie Smaffers on Facebook. It says, "What's you, what are your thoughts on adding more GT only races to the IMSA schedule?" Um, I think the, the, what you don't want to mess with is getting the IMSA schedule to be too deep. Uh, IMSA is already a pretty expensive championship. What you wouldn't want to be doing is to add too much extra expense and additional rounds to that. The other thing to remember is, of course, you know, we are going through a period right now where the numbers of GTE cars out there, GTLM cars, my apologies, Josie, for uh, IMSA um, racing, is not exactly at a high. That's not a direct encouragement to offer the opportunity for uh, GT-only races. If your lead class is not going to be that deep, Yes, you've got large numbers of GTD cars, potentially, but if your GTLM field is not deep enough, then that could cause a problem. Well, In the current situation that we've got with GTLM globally, do you think that by adding more GT-only races onto the schedule in advance and letting people know they're going to do it in advance, it might attract manufacturers to the formula to think, actually, five times a year, we're going to win the races overall? Because we know from talking to people in paddocks, be it P2, be it GT, 
sometimes they feel they don't get enough coverage even though the racing's amazing and they're a factory team it's a fair point but my view would be you'd need to start making those decisions more than a year in advance if you're talking about adding um, if you like uh, pro uh, privateer teams into GTLM then that's one thing if you're looking to attract another manufacturer reasonably speaking you need to start that conversation probably two to three years ahead to say this is our vision that you know, there are going to be three, four races a year where you get that opportunity to actually take the win overall and get all the TV and all of the plaudits and all of the media coverage. I think it's a perfectly viable uh, proposition, but the, the key to it is going to be the time scale, the time frame that you're dealing with to actually make those decisions. Mm. We heard the GT only sprint ra- or GT Pro sprint races were banded around about WC and they never yeah. actually. Jump, made the jump and did it. Thing, wasn't it? It was yeah. a Saturday thing. I remember that was an issue. Uh, Darren Cox idea when he was at the head of the Nissan Motorsport. And I it think it's a good idea. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It gives you a, a tight um, platform for something that is made for TV. If you like, it becomes more difficult the less depth you've got in your field. What we've got at the moment, the WEC R6 factory cars. There are six extremely good factory cars. You know, we've seen five of them uh, today at the track. Uh, new look Aston Martin livery with uh, you know uh, their 2019-20 efforts new look um, AF Corset livery a little bit back to the future for them with a different flat red colour and of course new revised Porsche uh, effort with the um, remarkably similar looking differentiated liveries on the now side uh, exhaust exiting uh, 911 RSR 19s but what do I think we're going to see I'll be honest with you in a period of time where the ACO have not been particularly brilliant with the, uh, the way in which we've seen the on-track performance with that equivalent technology, they've got balance of performance pretty right. I can hear you all wailing about Aston Martin at Le Mans. I've yet to hear an explanation that actually gives me comfort that the changes that were made, the, 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 uh, the margins of changes that were made for their balance of performance should have led, led to such a massive drop-off in performance. And I think there's more to it than that. I think there are questions to be asked about the operating window for that car. How will it actually deal with its tyres over a full stint or a double stint? It's not just BOP. There are other issues too. Remember, that was a very new car last season. Mm. Carrying on, we've got Nate Detweiler now on Facebook. He says, isn't a Europol still planning to run IMSA rounds at Laguna and Petite? We asked the question, I know because it's been a busy weekend, I'm afraid we've not got the answer back from the Inter-Europol team, and well done for them, by the way, bringing home a win in LMP3 at Barcelona this uh, this last weekend. Uh, I suspect the answer is that it's in some question because that we're, they're now heading towards a multi-car entry in the Asia Le Mans series. Their principal um, programmes are in ACO Rules Racing, without a shadow of a doubt. They're certainly interested in coming to... IMSA rules racing uh, when they got the opportunity but principally they would like to get both of their LMP2 cars into the Le Mans 24 hours they're not going to do that by doing those two IMSA races one thing that they've proven over the past few years is that they take their racing very seriously and they don't rush into things if they think doing IMSA would be a stretch too far they wouldn't just go for it would they no they're not going to do it just because it's a good thing to do and they're certainly not going to do it because it's a good thing for, for IMSA they do it because there was a reason behind their business plan. Uh, and they've got a multi-level business plan now with a growing list of customer, drivers and clients to deal with. Uh, do I think that, the, uh, that they're definitely not doing it? I think they probably aren't now doing it. We do need to get that answer from uh, you know, one of our, our favourite Polish endurance racing team, I think it's fair to say. Mm. But do I think that's gone forever? No. They're clearly attracted by the big races in North America. And why wouldn't you be? They're, they're awesome. I mean, you know, with Daytona, with Sebring, with Watkins Glen in the middle as being, you know, a kind of festival of motorsport there. And, of course, with Petit Le Mans. It is one of those perfectly packaged things. But the logistics of tagging that onto a WC season are now really very tricky indeed. And even for the likes of Inter Europol with a programme that now involves three separate championships at the lower level in Europe there's the Ultimate Cup with their GT3 cars you've got the European Le Mans series with an LMP2 car and two LMP3s and a multi-car entry 
I think we could be talking three or four cars in Asia this year. That's the one that I think may have done the damage to their aspirations, their earlier aspirations for IMSA, is that we are now looking at them, looking towards the Asian Le Mans series as something that could deliver them exactly what they'd like to, to get, which is two LMP2 entries for Le Mans 24 hours. Mm. Speaking of Petit Le Mans, Chris Ward on Facebook says, with the WC side of the Ford GT programme complete, will we see all four of the GTs at Petit Le Mans as a farewell? No. No, we won't. And the reason I say that with a fair degree of confidence is because I'm very aware that a number of the drivers have not been retained. Uh, I think you might well see uh, a pretty large proportion of the US end of the Chip Ganassi Racing Ford efforts retained in some regard for whatever comes next, whether or not there's a bridging programme in, in IMSA, whether or not we move directly to a test and development you know, race programme for a DPI uh, programme there. I think you're still going to see those guys retained. But I think the uh, the guys in Europe have been less lucky. Some of them have got other programmes. Harry Tinkle, for instance, got another programme. Obviously, Andy Prio has got his WTCR programmes. But as far as the um, WC programme, the 4GT programme is concerned, I can tell you this much. Um, spoke, as you'd have heard if you listen to the Inside the Sports Car Paddock uh, podcast, to Stefan Mucker, for instance, and he was driving that car, the 66 Ford, up the hill at Goodwood just a few weeks ago for what he described as being the very last time. Hmm. Another question from Chris now. He says, does Chip Ganassi Racing have any plans for IMSA in 2020? Uh, have a read. I mean, I can just say what I've said before. Have a read of Marshall Perrett's stuff on racer.com. Marshall, with a combination of, you know, dogged adherence to his contact book and the facts... Uh, a degree of informed speculation and putting those strands together I think has got it pretty well nailed the one thing we don't know right now is when is the button going to be pushed and what we believe now is going to be uh, a Ford DPI project is that going to be imminent is it going to be a year before we see it are they going to wait to DPI 2.0 we don't know Um, and I think at the moment we're happy to wait and uh, see that one come out. If it is somewhere in the future, might we see some extension uh, to some degree for the Ford GT programme? Again, we don't know. What we do know is that uh, Ford executives have been pretty highly motivated to push forward with the plan, at least in North America. Mm. Talisto now on USCR Reddit says he's only just found the podcast, so forgive me if it's been asked before, but is IMSA strictly based in North America or have they flirted with the idea of travelling to other tracks and other continents? Um, number one, you're very welcome and welcome aboard to what it continues, and we can see the numbers, so it continues to be an increasingly happy band of followers for these podcasts. Um, it's a fair question. This is an excellent world's leading package of uh, racing. Now, you know, no matter whether or not you're a fan or otherwise of the Inter Weather Tech Sports Car Championship, the reality is that you don't have to walk far down Limsa Paddock for one of their major weekends to see the depth there is pretty world-leading in terms of the package. It is high-quality racing all the way down the card. Um, as Have they considered uh, an away race? I'm sure they've considered it, and we've not seen any particular um, edge towards that. Uh, what we have seen in the past in the American Le Mans series days, in the early days there, was the American Le Mans series had a, uh, races in Europe. We saw races at Silverstone, we saw races at Donington Park and Nürburgring. And Did the they do Australia as well? There was the uh, race, yes, of the race of a thousand years. So, but that was a different era. Uh, right now, I think we're dealing with new reality. We're dealing with, with a reality where a goodly proportion of any grid in international sports car racing is privately funded. With away days comes big budget reissues. And as I said a little earlier in the show, IMSA, WC, for instance, extremely expensive. Mm. And very expensive is if it's your money, as in yours, not an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, but yours as an individual, presumably wealthy person that pursues your passion through motorsports. Uh, the answer, I think, I'd love to think that we'd, we could see you know, a bit of a return fixture. We see with a double header with Sebring, Super Sebring with uh, the WC and M. So whether Tech Sports got a championship on the same bill, I'd love to think that we could do that somewhere else outside of North America and see the M. So whether Tech Sports got a championship somewhere there. I fear that is not something we're going to see anytime soon. 
Anders Oz on USCR Reddit says, is there any insight to when the CAR will officially break cover? We've got a few ideas as to when that might be, and every reason to believe that it will be the case. There's lots of interesting questions about uh, what that might be. I've had one uh, correspondent in the UK some months ago believing. We've even seen one of those cars testing in the UK in the months that were passed. All sorts of questions about the powertrain, all sorts of questions about the point at which we will first see that car race, all sorts of questions about whether or not it will be a GTLM only that comes out from the C8 platform. Uh, certainly that launch went around the world. Um, I think it received a lot more positivity than perhaps some of the earlier uh, web rumours about powertrain, for instance, uh, received. And it's going to be interesting to see how sales go. It's great to see, by the way, some really positive response from the Australian market to the fact that with right-hand drive cars, that uh, Australia is a confirmed market for that. We don't yet know whether or not the UK is going to be. Uh, but lots of story strands to emerge. There is not a defined date for it. Uh, but I will be looking for that in the coming weeks. Another question from him. He says, is there any possibility that we will see Aston Martin running in IMSA before the next GTE rule set? I think there's every possibility you'll see an Aston Martin or two running, as we've seen uh, before. Uh, whether or not it will be a full season effort really comes down to whether or not Aston Martin can find a partner that's prepared to invest in that platform. I think they'd be a very worthy addition to the IMSA Championship. But uh, am I seeing anybody stepping up at the moment with multiple millions of dollars uh, to do that? The answer is no. The, um, the Aston Martin Racing and Aston Martin Lagonda operations certainly took a very good look at the marketplace. There was uh, a couple of uh, stabs at trying to identify a funding partner. I've certainly spoken to a couple of people, a party to those negotiations. So Aston Martin have not been idle. I think, though, the, the marketplace is rather different to where they perhaps desire it. It is not now um, littered with uh, like-minded individuals, Steve and I, Steve, and that just love their racing, would love to spend every waking moment and every other dollar on it. The reality now is there's a bit of a difference between uh, those that are prepared to actually take a punt on uh, racing and those that are prepared to pay the bill in full. I think uh, Aston Martin might find that if they want a North American presence, the purse strings are going to be loosened. And that maybe right now, that's not one of the major priorities. Mm. He has a third and final question. He says, uh, would the ACO FIA be open to adding additional LMP2 manufacturers in the next two years? And do any exist that could take the opportunity up? I think the answer is, uh, there's an open question about what is going to come for the next range of LMP2 uh, licenses, what those cars are going to look like, what is the pace of those cars going to be, bearing in mind the context with hypercar, which are into and around LMP2's current race pace, for instance, that I'm on. Are there other manufacturers that might put their hat in the rings? At least a couple I could think of. I think we mentioned them last week. Uh, we've seen the Decano engineering operations step up and take over the Norma LMP3 effort. You'd have to think that they'd take a good look this. Norma have before now had MP2s. This though is a completely different um, company. They're actively involved as a race team in MP2. My guess is that uh, Duquesne Engineering might certainly put in a commercial assessment of whether or not there's a marketplace for their product. The other one is pretty clear. It's Ginetta. And it's, it's Ginetta for, for two or three very good reasons. They have uh, an active LMP1 programme. They've therefore invested in the chassis technology uh, there's not a massive difference there between what they're doing in P1 and what at a more sustainable, slightly kind of less bespoke level would be required for P P2. The other thing is they've got a new P3 they're about to launch and where they've been caught before without having a license for P2 is they were losing potential P2 clients because they didn't have a, 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 a rung on the ladder to go to from LMP3. So I would be very surprised indeed if Lawrence Tomlinson and his team uh, in Yorkshire and the UK were not actively looking at, assessing, negotiating whether or not there might be a possibility for a Ginetta P2. And I'll be frank, if we get to the stage, and I think we will do, that uh, the aspiration for Team LNT to, to mount a full season LMP1 effort in the FIWC, um, I'm frank, if they do produce that, then they darn well should have the confidence reinvested in them with every opportunity to be successful in the marketplace. There is space for them. Mm. 
Final IMSA question coming up now. We've got Ice Coffee, also on USCR Reddit, says, Why did BMW decide to go from two of the greatest sounding GT race cars, being the M3 GT2 and Z4 GT3 slash GTLM, to two of the worst sounding race cars? Uh, because efficiency. Uh, I'm afraid that's the game we're now in. It's about fuel efficiency, talk. It's about all those terribly, terribly dull uh, sounding things that, that potentially make the, the difference with success. It's worth mentioning, by the way, about that um, M8 GTE, GTLM, um, that that car is not the car that BMW wanted to produce. That uh, We'll go back over that, uh, that history of the M8, um, which was that the proposal they initially put forward saw that car being very much lower slung, um, that the, the um, height in the car would be taken out effectively the middle of the door line. That was a proposal because it's a waiver that needed to be um, approved by all of the other manufacturers, and at least two of those manufacturers left it very late to say no. Uh, maybe a little bit of payback for a couple of liberties that BMW had taken in the past. So fundamentally, they came into that programme a little bit on the back foot. The change you would see if you had a measuring tape uh, to put that car is a tiny slice off the bottom of the door um, from the M8 GT11 Kingston Road car, but it is taller than the car was designed to be. Um, so what you've got is a car that is not the big boy that uh, internet would actually say that it is, but certainly it's not as sleek a, a, a car that BMW would have preferred that they had as for the soundtrack, I sort of agree with you. I'm not a massive lover of the soundtrack for most of the current Vogue of turbocharged V8s. Uh, I think they tend to be not the most inspiring of soundtracks. Yeah, it's just underwhelming, isn't it? It's a bit underwhelming when you're used to the screaming V8s and all sorts of other, all sorts of other good things. But um, let's wait and see. We, we're going to get to hear the Porsches in anger for the first time tomorrow, Stephen, and I'll be very happy indeed to report back our our all findings um, from their first opportunity to get around the circuit to Catalonia tomorrow mm. Weck Aslam's Elms Echo are you ready Graham? it's my favourite <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start off with Sad Boys 2 Men on WC Reddit I think that's Sad Boys to Men isn't it? Um, is it not sad, is it in Bad Boys 2 the movie? so Sad Boys 2 I could be sad about Boys to Men but there's every reason to be for so many reasons mm. well Whatever, we can whoever it is, he's asked the question. <laughs> well, he says, who in the WC really gets it? This could be a driver or an engineer, a team owner, a race official, whatever. Who in your mind has an attitude towards the particular series that em- to in- sorry, an attitude towards this particular series that embodies what you think the series should be? Conversely, and this might not be a question you want to answer, who doesn't get it? I think it's it's a really tricky question to ask because there's all sorts of things. There are a lot of very soundly minded individuals involved, and that includes people within some of the families of the um, OEM teams, the factory teams, and you know LMP1 in the past. You know, you, you've got to you've got to say uh, you would have to go an awfully long way uh, to find somebody that gets it better than Dr. Wolfgang and Goldrick got it. In terms of, and for that, what I mean is his absolute adherence to excellence, his um, sporting outlook, having been a very good winner, he was an extremely good loser. And in particular, towards the end of the Audi program, uh, it was always inspiring to see the way that Audi dealt with the fact that they were not the fastest, the most reliable. Um, they never lost their class with that. And beyond that, when you got the opportunity, as we did, from time to time um, to to talk to the man uh, he was passionate he had things to say about the brand and, and the fan base and what that all meant so Dr. Wolkan Ulrich I think was the guy that got it, there's another man that I'm going to mention here in a very different kind of vein and sadly no longer with us and uh, that was Hugh Hayden uh, previously at the top of Seba Motorsports and uh, the Rebellion Racing took, take his position taken of course um, certainly until the end of last season as the team manager for Rebellion Racing um, by Bart Hayden uh, certainly the son of his father and you didn't go to either, uh, either of those two guys 
to go and get some horrendous scoop on the back of somebody else. What you got went to them for was a calm and collected take on an issue of the day. You would get balance, you would get um, a little bit of analysis, you would get generosity in terms of their time and intellect and knowledge uh, against sometimes some of the complex problems. And that, that, in my early days, certainly of dealing with racing at that kind of level, was absolutely invaluable in just getting to understand uh, that racing is very often not what it appears to be. You've had that experience, Stephen, coming in to motorsport as your full-time career, and I can vividly remember some of our early conversations about this, that the difference between that statistical um, bobble hat knowledge, and I say that with passion, and the difference between the reality of things like the cost of racing, balance of performance, um, the role of a driver in a team, the things that you learn when you get the opportunity to go behind the curtain. Hmm. You, you really do. I think the biggest lesson I've learned over the years is nothing, nothing at all is as simple as it may seem. It's so easy when people ask some of these questions or they put post comments on social well, media. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, but... A lot of the time, and it's usually when people are cynical about something, yeah. it's the, why don't they just do this question? Yeah. It's never as easy no. as just doing that. No. I've, I've actually had a couple of remarkable conversations with people in positions of influence, both within the team environment and within the organisation environment, in the last 24 hours. Um, and as a result of those conversations and prior conversations, some remarkable things are beginning to happen. Some remarkable people have had conversations about EOT and whether or not you know your view is that things are happening too late. The rea- reality is, is things are now happening. We are going to see some other changes around some of the, the racing packages that we hold dear. And that's because I think people are beginning to be pragmatic. I think the new reality of the world of international racing is beginning to occur to people. We're in a tough spot here that we are not going to get massive amounts of money being pumped in by these big OEMs unless and until there's a technology-led reason to do so. So we need to get to that stage, we need to get to that place, and we need to do that without damaging the core business. I, I'd say this, if if you are one of our, you're obviously one of our listeners, that goes to, otherwise you're not listening to me, but yeah. um, but if you are one of those, those guys that gets involved in debate or indeed argument online, Listen to the other, the other side of the argument. You know, ask questions, ask for answers, and judge the quality of the debate by the quality of the answers that you're given. And ask yourself as well, what are you hearing? What are you seeing when you see those answers? Are you seeing fact or are you seeing opinion? And place, whether or not you like the answer, place a lot more value on the answers you're given that employ fact than opinion. Mm-hmm. True words, very much spoken there. And just before we move on, I will throw one name into the ring of people who get it. And this is one of my all-time heroes, Omri Pescarolo. He's oh, yeah. a man who absolutely is the spirit of endurance. He's the spirit. It sounds so cliche and so ACO press conference to say it. But he overlapped, obviously, at the start of the WC. And he never gave up. He always did a lot with a little. He employed some fantastic people to drive for him, work for him. They all had major respect for him didn't always make the right decisions when he was no. running that race team but he was uh, he was the sort of guy who was so heavily respected that even when he did make mistakes everyone would band around to try and make sure that he could carry on yeah you know at the end of the day passion matters passion is really important and it's not just about who's got the biggest wallet but actually it's about the people who are prepared to put it on the line and put cars out there is to make those decisions to say I'm going to take that risk and too few people prepared to do that nowadays it's you know it's an interesting moment now you know when it is getting more difficult more risky more expensive more time consuming you know we need to embrace those people I mean the likes of Francois Perodet spending his own money coming racing and putting together really good programs with really great drivers in LMP2 cars and in GT Am cars yes it's his passion but without that and without maybe five or six or eight Paul Dallalanas and, you know, Thomas Fleurs around, um, a Gidea Perfetti, without that, ask yourself, 
in the WEC, for instance. It's, by the way, it's exactly the same in the EMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Ben Keating being a great example of it. Without those people, ask yourself, look down the entry list that you hold so dear. Cross off the names that are probably paying for the lot in that team and ask yourself, how much fun would it be if they weren't there? Next time you see them, just say words like this. Thank you for pursuing your passion in an area where we can enjoy it because we don't say it often enough. Mm. Next up was another question from WC Reddit. It's from Clemen- Clemencito. Is it? Yes. It sounds, sounds a little bit like a slightly dodgy magician. Mm. It sounds like you know, the sort of thing you'd see on a sign on the road here, the side here in, in Spain, to be honest. Sorry, Cle- probably right. Clemencito to the right. Clemencito yeah. to the right, just past I'd, the abattoir and the bullring. If he is a road sign, he's done remarkably well at writing this question, to be Fantastic. honest. Fantastic. It says, during the four hours of Barcelona, it seemed the LMP3 cars had some trouble at times getting by GTE competitors. Is this down to the nature of the Catalonia circuit being hard to overtake on, or do P3 machines genuinely lack pace compared to GT cars in their current iteration? If the latter is true... Is the ACO planning to boost the LMP3 cars to fix this problem? That's a pretty simple answer to this. Well, you want to go for it? The answer. <laughs> well, the answer is they are planning to boost the LMP3 cars, aren't they? We've, got yeah. the, the, we've seen the first of those iterations. Yes, we have. And we've got 20, uh, 2020 is when they're first going to be introduced. There's four chassis, and they're all running a brand new spec engine. About 40 um, horsepower up on the cars that we've got now. Yeah, and I think... Um, while there's always the argument of is it necessary to have everyone upgrade an engine, um, there's various reasons to why they've made this decision. I think there's plenty of people in the paddock who welcome the idea of being able to go a little bit faster to give themselves a little bit of extra pace when they're racing against GTE cars. Um, but yeah, I think the the Catalonia circuit in particular is one of those tracks that car, the cars qu- can't quite stretch their legs can they as, as much as they can at places like Ricard and Monza so the power advantage you have over like a GT car and LMP3 isn't quite there which is what we were talking about earlier with an LMP3 being able to hold up a GT3 car if you're being tactical about it yeah. you know it's it, it is that sort of circuit the reality is on pace they should be at least a couple of seconds up the road but it's simpler it's simple to say that, but when you've got a pro-am competition, when you've also got, remember, really extreme heat here. I mean, driver fatigue here was a real issue, even over the four-hour race, when you've got two driver squads. And, uh, you know, and a, a couple of the, the guys that were actually down in pit lane for the uh, European Le Mans series did note that drivers you would expect to get out of the cars during a free practice session looking fit as a fiddle, looking like they could go off and, you know, pump iron straight afterwards. We're getting out, if not in some distress, but certainly looking like they had a bit of workout. It was hard work here. Uh, So, you know, nature of the circuit, the fact that these GT3 cars are really very quick indeed in a straight line, um, and the fact that you're actually uh, dealing with the the issues of heat, all of those things would have actually come into uh, to to, um, to the, the, the the mix during what was a busy old time. And the other thing is, there's 41 cars out there. It was a busy, busy circuit at times. And, you know, calling that race for TV, there were multiple times when we were seeing trains of five, six, seven cars with traffic trying to come through. It doesn't take much uh, to get to the stage where you lose, you know, more than a handful of seconds in a particular corner. Mm. Who was we talking about today that talked about... It was uh, Igor Rajev, wasn't it? Mm. Um, having a chat with the, the genetic era Igor X S and P racing driver will be one of the the guys having a go in the Geneta uh, over the next two days, talking about trying to keep to his delta time at Le Mans, being caught at the wrong point coming into Indianapolis. I think he said behind mm. a GT Am car. Yeah, he lost eight seconds in that that sequence of corners because mm, it was under it was under yellow. He couldn't get past him, couldn't and the gentleman him. was going way too way slow. Too slow. And so it's easy to actually find. A dramatic effect uh, on your race plan simply because you've caught the wrong car with the wrong driver at the wrong time in the wrong conditions. Mm. Uh, carrying on now, we've got Alex Gold who says, "What track would you like to see most on the WC calendar? I'd like to see them flying around Monza. Uh, I'd like Monza to have actually a bit of a crack of it. I'm a firm fan. Stephen knows this of um, you know, major championships having a stable calendar and building up." That, um, that date 
as you know, my good friend, uh, you know, John Hindoff uses the phrase date equity. It's a great way of explaining it. It's that something that actually American Le Mans series were very good at back in the day is putting your races in the same places around the same time every year. So actually the local fan base know to put it in their calendar and it's always going to be there. I like that, but I also like the fact that I think actually every championship owes it to itself to actually keep that flexibility. Uh, one of the championships has always been very good at this. It's it's the, I guess, you know, one of the lesser known championships, if you're not a firm follower of European racing, is the International GT Open. They've traditionally had, effectively, an away race. And by that, I don't mean it's a race in a different country. They race all over Europe, but they keep one race that is not a regular addition to the calendar to actually just mix it up. And I like that a lot. It has given them an opportunity to go to a remarkable array of tracks over the years. I'd like to see that happen with the WEC more often. Mm. Um, but, you know, where we perhaps go to somewhere that, you know, would be just attractive to the fans and attractive to the teams as well. The list of, of, of venues for that, well, there's a couple in North America, Laguna Seca, always love to go there. Road America is, you know, on my bucket list. Um, we wouldn't because we've already got a Fuji race, but Suzuka, um, you know, in terms of Australia, just about anywhere, just, I just love racing in Australia. It's as simple as that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, to Monza, I've quite like to see that the Red Bull Ring, actually. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a cracking track. It's, it's pretty tight and twisty. Really underrated, I think. It's, it is, but and it's, a, you know, it's a long way for the teams to go to with the majority of the teams from, you know, um, from Western and Central Europe. But they're on the bucket list of the teams, of the, the tracks that I'd actually like to see our cars, our teams, having a crack around. Anything more you'd have? Hashtag me personally. I'd like to see Sepang. Um, it's the circuit that I always used to enjoy the most on the F1 calendar when I used to follow F1 avidly. I just think it's a fantastic circuit. And I hear so many good things from people like yourself, Graham, who have been there multiple times and, and say it's a lovely country to visit. It Kuala is. Lumpur's a great place. It's just a place I really want to go to. OK, well, there you go. They're the, they're the ones we'd love to see. It's an international championship. All bets are off. And aside from the romanticism of some of the, the tracks that would be great to visit but absolutely impractical for top uh, class uh, you know, sports cars I think they're, they're the ones that uh, would certainly be on my bucket list mm. it's netting because it's better than Bathurst I've heard <laughs> <laughs> 24 Lemons asks the three position lights have been in use in Le Mans and associated championships since about 2006 are there any plans to update the system as in Dakar and IMSA both have in my opinion they're more sophisticated and informative versions which make the FIA WC's tech look primitive in comparison I completely agree um, whether or not it's on the priority list I don't know uh, whether it should be yes I think I agree with you I think there's some great systems out there and there's a, in a um, global fan facing media focused OEM Attractive, which is what they'd like to be, championship, I think there needs to be a step up. I think they've been cautious. They've been trying to keep costs down in what is already a very expensive championship. But perhaps with um, Hypercar coming, now's the time to actually make that change. I, I completely agree. Adam Weller, next up, one of our colleagues at DailySportsCar.com. He says, what are the chances of a return to the LMS for the new top class. I'm well aware that grid numbers wise it's not even close to needed, but I wonder if it might be a good option for smaller teams and manufacturers. And I think he's, he's talking about hypercar here. It absolutely is. Hello, Adam. Uh, I think the answer is I don't think so. I think we're a little more worried about getting enough hypercars in WC before we get to that. Um, where there might be an opportunity, if we got, for whatever reason, let's say 2008 and the financial crash happened again and a world championship became unsustainable. You know, if we then got to the stage where you're looking to take a step back with something like an ILMC, uh, not by the way on the horizon at all, then potentially you're looking there at something where you parachute into three or four big races a year, you know, a top class with Le Mans and maybe a couple of other blue ribbon events and a couple of other rotating events. Do I think we're, we're looking at that? I think that's a decision that could only be taken in two circumstances. One, on the back of success for the uh, hypercar class per se, and two, dependent on how successfully the uh, rule makers can actually amend the 
um, can amend the LMP2 regulations to accommodate hypercar. Smoking Puppy 841 says, do you think the constructor limit in LMP2 and LMP3 should be removed as long as um, as long as there are constructors that comply with the cost limit? I think it may help bring more variety to the grids. I was never a fan of what they did, I'll be honest with you. And I think the uh, the reality is, to a greater or lesser degree, that experiment failed. Uh, it, it brought one very good thing. I think the spec Gibson engine has been a success. Huge a success. Down. Huge success. Um, and I'd like to see them kind of, kind of think again about that. I think it's slightly over-regulated. And what that's meant is that there's not been enough of uh, enough flexibility to allow manufacturers that perhaps didn't get it as right as Orica did. Um, or by the way, Orica did have a bit of a lead on that. Uh, that the manufacturers didn't get it as right as Orica did are rather hampered and been on the back foot for rather too long. Um, let's wait and see. Uh, I mean, I'm not even hearing hints yet of what's up for grabs in LMP2. Mm. And we look forward to hearing what they have to say when they eventually get around to it, but they're quite busy, I've heard, Very at the moment busy. at the ACA. Andrew Muggeridge says, what's the benefit for the European Le Mans series and the Barcelona circuit of having a race where the number of cars on the grid outnumbers the spectators? Um, I, I saw a couple of comments on, on the, the social media whilst commentating on this race. I think there's two or three things you have to, uh, to, to explain here. Number one is, we've not been here before. For 10 years there's not a fan base here it's a straight answer so the work is required and there's not a lot of budget to do that second thing is it really was extreme weather it was properly hot and those are not covered grandstands so to expect people to be in the grandstands for a four-hour race albeit into darkness was a bit of pretty big call there were actually quite a lot of people around i popped into pit lane uh, during the uh, the autograph session what's but was quite a compressed uh, schedule and I was surprised how many people were there. And whilst it wasn't a rammed full grid, the reality was the grid was pretty full as well. So I think the number of people around, um, it certainly wasn't in the tens of thousands. Uh, but, you know, uh, you're, you're talking to um, someone involved here uh, with a broadcast for this championship as well as you know, someone that, uh, both as a journalist and someone responsible for other journalists that cover this championship we've been with this from the very start and I want to go back to the Red Bull Ring because mm. we enjoy that place we enjoy the surroundings and in particular we enjoy Venus schnitzel mixed <laughs> mushroom sauce but we certainly do I think the other thing to note with the, um, the circuit of Catalonia is it's a bit like Silverstone in a sense that unless there's 200,000 people there, it looks empty. There's yeah. so many grandstands. Yeah. They're all in view of the TV cameras. Yeah. And there's also some places around that circuit that you can stand and get really good views from that aren't seen on TV cameras. For instance, the roof over the pit lane yeah. was, you know, had a reasonable amount of people on it the few times I went up there. And that's a really good vantage point because you can see all the way down to turn one. Um, so it's, it's things like that. It's it's all very well. I mean, us talking about the fans, but the reality uh, of Barcelona and where it falls massively short, I'm afraid for me, is the the lack of easy access to uh, Venus Schnitzel mixed mushroom sauce uh, <laughs> compared to the Red Bull Ring. And I, I, I feel it's it's only right to pass on the crushing blow that was dealt to us. Are you soapboxing here? Like, is this a sneaky soapbox it moment? May, it may be uh, Christophe Boucher's hammer and pouring smoke box. Was the crushing blow on going to our? <laughs> I'm going to go on about this until I get my point out. Um, that uh, we were looking at uh, my good co- my good friend and colleague David Law's behest in protest of not going to the Red Bull Ring for an evening meal featuring Venus Schnitzel mixed mushroom sauce, which he which he said would be called a protest schnitzel, Pro- which, protest which schnitzel. sounds fantastic. It does indeed, and indeed, I should tell you, dear listeners, and I'm hoping there's more than one of you by this stage in this argument. That uh, within something like 300 metres of our hotel, we did indeed see a massive sign that said Vienna. Clearly, a, a um, you know a Viennese um, themed restaurant. When we got closer to it, I think it's fair to say that it was Viennese themed. It was. It looked kind of at the architecture that is typically Austrian. And indeed, when we parked up, 
all the staff were wearing lederhosen. Yes, so we genuinely went, they were. We, we went in and we expected, this is absolutely the most amazing coincidence. We were just talking about a protest schnitzel. And indeed, we are going to be successful in getting that protest schnitzel. Slight problem was, Vienna restaurant, with its chalet-like architecture and um, lederhosen-clad staff, and was, music and music and music and a grand piano on a balcony in the middle of the restaurant a grand piano on a balcony in the middle of the restaurant we are not making this up dear listener didn't sell any Austrian food whatsoever not even close not even not close. even Austrian beer no nope. there was nothing there was nobody nothing. spoke German it was ridiculous it was somebody <laughs> had had a really good idea and then fallen massively massively short mm. so there you have it um Barcelona I have fond memories of Barcelona I spent many weeks here in 1992 um with a professional role at the Barcelona Olympics. Um, I've been back for visits since then. I've been back here racing 10 years ago with the Le Mans series, um, but I want to go back to the Red Bull Ring. Mm. Uh, and there's a particular reason. I'm just going to make sure that everybody got the message. I want to go back to the Red Bull Ring, and it is <laughs> Venus Schnitzel mit Mushroom Sauce. <laughs> Perfect. Never a truer word spoken. Rob Chalmers says, Would it benefit the adoption of hybrid tech to allow the Formula E model? I.e. start with all control parts, year two open up the motors, year three open up the inverters, ETC, ETC. Um, okay, I think there's some sound logic there. Uh, if that became a model that's particularly in GT racing, came forward. If, though, what you mean by adopting the Formula E model is have one-day meetings, pounding sounds, and uh, highly professional drivers making a habit of driving into each other, the answer is no. <laughs> Alex Gold says, Should the hypercar class be open to privateers, would a non-platinum-rated driver be eligible to enter... Um, hang on. Yes and yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Would, they be enter to, would they be eligible to enter... Buy and run a car. Yes, yes they yes. are. I mean, yeah. the, the answer is it is effectively a direct replacement for LMP1. Um, by regulation, drivers down to silver ranking can already therefore take part, as uh, regular followers of uh, the FIWC will be aware. There was a driver this current season, that being Enric Edman, who was given dispensation despite the fact he's a bronze because he had extensive LMP2 experience to race in LMP1. So the answer is I expect all of the above to be on the rule book, and I also expect at least one uh, high level um, privateer entered hypercar to be on the entry for year one. Doug Bonham on Facebook says, It feels strange to have Le Mans in the rearview mirror, the ELMS in almost every other racing series in its mid-season, and the WC preparing for the pre-season in July. Pretend it's 2022. Does this start to feel normal? 2020. It sounds like a fake year. (laughs) Does this start to feel normal for the WC? And how seriously will the WC take date date equity, as your phrase, in regards to making it feel normal moving forward? Uh, I think the answer is, uh, I hear regular observations i'm not going to call them moans and gripes because they're not they're observations that actually the shift to the winter base schedule where we finish with the Le Mans 24 hours has opened up a can of worms in a number of ways not just the commercial cycles that are involved with many teams struggling to make that transition um, away from long established commercial uh, process but uh, things like driver rankings, where you've got the ridiculous situation that you can actually get to the stage where you could and would be a silver-ranked driver in Asia, a silver-ranked driver in uh, the WEC, but a gold-ranked driver in the LMS, uh, because that's the way it could actually work, depending on when that grading took place and which drives you accept or negotiate. So there are a range of areas where this is causing problem it's what you, what happens when you overlay one system on another on another on another um, will it ever become normalized it will become more normal because it's going to become the cycle unless something dramatic happens i don't expect it to um, is it causing problems well it does i mean i'll give, give you for instance i'm effectively as are you a freelance operator in motorsport and what we're in the process of doing at the moment is in a commercial cycle where we're talking about the things that we do under contract for calendar year 2020 but yet we're still negotiating into um, the uh, WEC season for the coming year and, and, and doing so at a rapid pace so there's a lot underway 
um, the industry absolutely has not adapted to that yet. Mm. Um, I I think, you know, absolutely needs to if they're going to have confidence that that's going to carry forward. Mm. And the strangest thing for me is the fact that the gap between the end of the Le Mans 24 hours and this prologue is smaller than some of the gaps between races in last season it's just very strange it, it seems to be coming at us at a pace but in fairness okay we've got prologue we've then got some some time before we go racing in early september but uh yeah it, it's uh, for me i i i worry that we start to sacrifice quality in all sorts of ways in the motorsport arena whether or not that's the kind of work that, that the guys like you and I can do whether or not it's the, the programs that teams can put forward simply because there is no breathing space mm. and you know if actually we're getting to the stage where I, mean, I think we are where to attract the attention for the very biggest races you know the Le Mans 24 hours is a great example of it that the smaller medium sized professional teams have to consider very actively doing multiple programs with multiple cars that is a huge endeavour. You know, for what is usually a very small business indeed, that is a massive amount of planning, logistics, time, energy, and indeed money. And if what you're doing is trying to spread those, if, for instance, you're doing the European Le Mans series and the Asian Le Mans series, there's no break. Mm. There is no break. We're talking here about the European Le Mans series finishing in October, the Asian Le Mans series starts in November, finishes in February, and then you're around again within weeks to a uh, uh, pre-season testing for the European Le Mans series. And that's just two, you know, continental championships. That is Mm. not a world championship. Um, There's things like the transition between having a full season ELMS uh, campaign and transitioning into the WEC. I still don't know how one or two of those teams are going to manage that, whether or not we're looking at some teams who are full season entrants in the ELMS actually missing the end of their season and potentially giving up the opportunity to compete for a title because a lot of their assets are actually in a container on the way to Shanghai and Fuji. Mm, certainly a lot of drivers have had to give up their chance they of have. the titles, haven't they? Um, James Counter, this is the final uh, question before we get onto the general section on Facebook. He says, you talked about the car car regs accommodating concept cars. As I understand it, there will be a stock chassis for prototypes. Can you foresee companies, possibly Kia, who don't have a hypercar, building a concept based on a stock chassis and then going and racing it to showcase the tech? Uh, not quite a stock chassis. Uh, there's, there, are, there are all sorts of ways in which it can be managed. There's no reason why, for instance, a, a, any manufacturer of race cars shouldn't produce effectively a mother chassis. There's no reason at all why that shouldn't happen. But we haven't yet heard that that's going to be the case. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, players in the motorsport market at the moment that are tiptoeing around this. We've now got through to the point where the first confidence bar, if you like, that we've actually got two manufacturers that are committed to OEMs, and that's no um, talking down to the likes of Jim Glickenhouse, but two major OEMs have now committed to those regulations. I think we'll start to see plans emerge, but probably not uh, for the first season of Hypercar. I think we might start to hear a lot more about things that are coming forward. I've already in the last week heard uh, and spoken about, uh, spoken to uh, three different individuals who have never really gone public about the fact they'd like to think about Hypercar in a serious way that all of a sudden they're saying, well, yes, it's on our, it's on our, our radar. How much longer it takes for those to become programmes is a very different matter. Mm-hmm. We're on to the general section now. We're going to start off with another question from Ryan Terpstra. He says, what would you do to increase event attendance? I suppose this carries on a bit from what we just talked about in Barcelona. Um, I think Ryan actually mentions he'd drive coaches to the local universities and hand out tickets. Mm. That's long been something I've actually said to a number of race organisers in the UK and way beyond that I think is a, it's a no-brainer for me. Mm. Look at what they do in Fuji, where they bring the school oh, yeah. kits. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, and does it require investment? Yes, it does. And you know, I'm tired of people who are responsible for um, promoting major, uh, major events and major venues telling me it costs money. Of course it costs money. Show a bit of confidence in your product. But there's nothing better in terms of building a fan base than getting kids involved. And I'm not being um, dismissive. By kids, I mean every, every kid from kind of school age up to college age 
um, get them involved, get them to bring their friends, get them to bring their families, incentivize them to bring people back. You know, give them, tell them, you know, you bring three people, you get two of those people in free. You know, tell them those things, get them in. Because sure as eggs is eggs, if you've actually got somebody who's never been to a motor race before and they come back and bring two other people, you're going to sell three burgers and not one. You're going to sell three uh, grandstand tickets and not one. You're going to sell three cups of coffee and not one or not none. Mm. And it needs, I think, people to take more risk. If you've got a motorsport venue and you want to take um, control of your own destiny, you've got to attract those big events. And big events become bigger the bigger the crowd you get through the turnstiles. Mm. You know, learn the lessons of history. And yes, find the, the opportunity to invest in those things. Yeah, if you're if you're in charge of an event which is looking to get some serious numbers of people through the gates, I think in today's sort of world... With motorsport in the way it is in public perception, one of the very important things I think for a lot of people who maybe bring family or friends who aren't used to going to motorsport events is having things at the um, at the events that aren't necessarily about racing, be it a concert, be it a big fan zone for kids, just additional activities so that if they are sitting on the grandstand, don't understand what's going on for hours on end. They're not going to be bored because there's something else to do. The, the That's diff- how you get people the in. Different, the difficulty I absolutely accept is scalability. You know, you're not. It is a crushing blow if you put a very large amount of money and efforts into building that crowd and they simply don't come. And what you've got is a fantastic show with nobody to see it. I get like that. Bahrain. Yeah, well, they, and they do put on a fantastic show. Yeah. you know, with with so many things to do behind that grandstand and tiny, tiny numbers of people turning up. But God bless them for trying. Yeah, but yeah. The, but the but the issue I think here is scalability, and it is about trying to build that up. And the best way to do that is to do it with organised parties. Organised parties. If you're making sure that's being facilitated, and it's with, as Ryan I think says, the educational market. You know that that coach is going to turn up and there's going to be 55 kids on it or 110 on two coaches or 220 on four coaches. And you accommodate that and you then get pester power to do its job, to go home and tell mum and dad, that was awesome. We got in on the Friday and Saturday for absolutely nothing. They've given me this, this envelope and told me to hand it to you, mum and dad. And what does that do? That gives us the opportunity to pay, let's say, £25 for our family of four. Um that's £25 they otherwise wouldn't have got. And that £25 will turn into multiples of £25 when that family needs to be entertained and needs to be fed. It's that kind of risk-taking to build those events from a position where those families put it into their calendar, those families feel a little bit more as if they own it, those families grow, and the, the, and the, the, the attachment to those events and those venues grows with it. Just don't think we see enough of that in the modern world anymore. And it, it's come on the basis that we've just got too many distractions, too many other things that people people can be spending their time and their money doing. I'd love to see more of it because when it does happen, it is awesome. Mm. There's nothing like being at a motor race where there's tons of people there. Tons of people there enjoying the spectacle and enjoying the other opportunities that that arise. And like I say, I've had some good conversations with some good people this week about you know improving the show at one or two events this year and you know get uh, the offer for more things for people to come and do and come and see and access to that and it's a privilege to be given the opportunity to have those conversations hmm. graham ingleby on twitter's up next he says is prototype the right name for the lmp cars while some of the technology may filter down to road cars, I've yet to see a Mondeo with a swan neck wing or shark fin over the rear hatch. How much does filter down from modern prototype racers? Well, I can tell you then, Graham. Obviously, you're not living in Essex, uh, where those kind of things are every day. Boy, down at, don't talk about Essex like that. Come on. So you see, it's getting aggressive already. Um, you're down at Lakeside, um, but the answer is, if you're looking for what modern prototypes have offered into the OEM marketplace, look no further. Than hybrid technology and in particular the step forward in battery technology where these are R&D programs and you're not necessarily going to see it you know uh, bolted on your car on the Monday uh, but what you might see is the next iteration of the higher level product from that manufacturer feature some of those innovations a good example for instance was the laser lighting on the Audis now okay that may have actually been an immediate promotional opportunity for a high-end option at the point at which it was uh, brought in it was the way in which for instance diesel power 
was introduced into the American Le Mans series by Audi. Uh, but for me, in the modern iteration, absolutely it's to do with the, the, the electrification side of things. It is the remarkable steps forward we, taught, we saw in the efficiency, the effectiveness of the battery technology in hybrids, particularly with Porsche, with you know like double the opportunity to store the energy with a, with a battery pack that, that actually didn't add any weight whatsoever. Mm. I spoke to the head of Goodyear uh, the last few days, and he specifically said that part of the reason that they want that brand in prototype racing is because they're currently um, developing and selling high-performance road car tyres, and being able to race in that sort of field does... Gives does, them yeah, does give them an opportunity to make improvements. Usain Boris, fantastic name. It says, <laughs> well, well <laughs> because it's funny, okay? Come on. Fantastic in its truest sense, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it says, with the Spa 24 hours this week, what's your assessment on the health of GT3 and Blanc Pan, and what do you see in its future given the WC's changes happening elsewhere in endurance racing? Um... It's an interesting question, and I think it's almost the wrong question with, with respect, and it's, it's IGTC as well as Blancpain. It's a bit of an enigma. Cars are awesome. Racing can be absolutely fantastic. Not seeing, outside of the big events, very much evidence of there being a fan base that gets off its backside and comes and watches it. Uh, and certainly we know what the figures are for the efforts that we've put in over the years, and I can tell you the audience outside of the really big events, does not appear to be growing with any sort of vigour whatsoever. Um, I would like to see those events shifting, and we do with the IGTC see evidence of that, from being uh, participation events to more spectator-based events, and in particular to events where those manufacturers are using the the events to activate road car uh, sales rather than race car sales. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Blancpain but Blancpain is often referred to in online discussion in particular about effectively being the answer to the questions that are being asked of the WC it's apples and pears mm. it's completely different it's for a different set of people isn't it and it's it's more focused on the teams and drivers that are competing it than it is about getting exposure or at least that, that used to be when Stefan first came it's, up with you know, it's, it, it, look, it's not getting around the fact you know, we're going to have 73 cars next next weekend at the spot 24 hours that is the the blue ribbon event on the Blunt Pan Endurance calendar it's one of the blue ribbon events of course on an increasingly impressive IGTC uh, calendar that said um, it effectively is their equivalent of the Le Mans 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, there are people that absolutely love that event. There's nothing wrong with the event whatsoever. It's a great event. As a race, I think it's been denuded of some of its character by decisions that have been made by the uh, race organisers. So I'm not going to bore anybody any further with my views on that one. Um, but I, I absolutely fundamentally reject the premise that... Um, yeah, there are all the lessons in the world to learn from what has happened with GT3 racing for the rest of the sports car universe. It is something completely different in very, very many ways. There are some lessons to be learned, but they probably aren't the ones that most people think they are. Um, the, the one that I absolutely think is worth learning for our good friends you know, at the ACO uh, is what Stefan Rattel has shown them is how effectively you can build your grid from the bottom upwards. So attracting a, um, a uh, very loyal returning band of privateers and professional race teams bringing customers, growing that grid in that way, rather than focusing the vast majority of your attention on a very small number of manufacturer entries that bring a much bigger spend into the into the pot. One final small point I'll make on that is a conversation we had recently where you said the interesting thing about GT3 and how it is at the moment is there's always a huge buzz when a new GT3 car gets launched. But that does not translate into audiences of people it actually going to watch them. It doesn't really translate into those audiences. I mean, you know, at, at, at this question, and I, I don't fully know the answer. I know the answer as it was until fairly recently, which is... I'll happily say that the streaming package that SRO puts together worldwide is pretty fantastic. It's so plug in and play. Yeah. You know e- what you're getting. Evidence by the fact, as we saw last year with Suzuka 10 hours, that when it goes wrong because someone actually has the wrong contracts in place and the wrong people are doing it, everybody notices. But I would hazard 
the, the, I'll give you this kind of uh, feedback too, is the numbers aren't that massive. We are not talking millions of people watching those races. We are talking tens of thousands of people often watching those races on that platform. That may or may not be a sustainable business model to carry it forward and to build it. Mm. Um, you know, that's that's something that's well worth thinking about. Have a look, you know, yourself at the numbers of the uh, the events that you you hold dear. Um, you know, I very happily and enjoyed commentating on SRO events. I'd happily do more if they asked me. Um, but you know, I would reject the premise that you know everything is right in one particular uh, event and championship and everything is wrong in another that tends to be good and bad in both Klaus Rorik Olsen on Facebook says hi guys I'm from Denmark and I'm thrilled to see so many Danes in the top tiers of motorsport we have almost no manufacturers um, that matter and only Mickey Mouse sized racetracks what other countries are overrepresented in motorsport today um, well there you go well New Zealand uh, tiny, mm. tiny nation, but with you know, Switzerland for that matter. Switzerland, which of course has banned uh, circuit motor racing. Okay, they had the Formula in Bern, didn't they? But uh, you know, long ago, in the wake of the Le Mans disaster, rather ironically, uh, banned circuit motorsport. But uh, two tiny nations with you know a very large footprint, indeed, particularly in endurance racing. Uh, there's an argument you could put the UK in there. Actually, we, we are a relatively small, physically small nation. Um, 60 million people or so but then you look at some of the international racing championships and look at the numbers of of Brits that are actually involved and by the way then if you scrape back the layers and look at the people involved both in the industry, the teams, the supply chain, a massive contribution to international motorsports, the UK certainly should be there and they get into the even tinier ones remember Le Mans this year we had five monoguest drivers um, in the uh, the Michelin Le Mans Cup, for instance, we have um, two successful teams from Luxembourg, mm. a tiny, tiny nation. We had a team from San Marino recently as well, that, but even tinier uh, nation. So oh, some of these are flags of convenience, some of them aren't. But uh, you're absolutely right. There are you know some beloved examples of uh, you know of, of uh, Nations that have actually got a lot to play with. Swiss, the Swiss example, I'll tell you this much. I remember at the time, before, well before his World Championship, a highly irritated Neil Jarney having a chat with me. I think it was in Bahrain, it must have been three, four, five years ago, that he just could not get Swiss TV uh, interested in the efforts of himself and his compatriots, despite the fact that, as I recall it, I think we had maybe one team in LMP1, which was a wider field at that time, that did not have a high-profile Swiss driver, all of whom were in the running for proper championship honours. And beyond that, you had others um, in LMP2 and now further down the field in the GT ranks from Switzerland too. And my advice to him was simple. Sit down with your compatriots, put some package together, put a little bit of money into that, show them how good this is, and they get coverage. Mm. Now, it's you know great to see success breeds success without a shadow of a doubt. You know, stand up, Tom Christensen, for the reason why the Danish nation is overrepresented in in um, uh, in endurance sports. Um, you know, and you and I both know uh, Stephen, a number of young Danish drivers that are involved in it, probably at least in one part because he's a national hero. Mm. Troavasaurus. Uh, he's got a really long question uh, so I will shorten it Um, the general question here is what would your advice be to somebody who's looking to follow in similar footsteps to you in terms of broadcasting don't do it it's a terrible job and I hate myself for doing it every single time I pick up a um, a a microphone I think the answer is it's not going to make you rich it might make you happy it'll make you tired it'll make you very tired I'm very tired right now I'm beginning to fall asleep in my chair here in in Barcelona but um, what advice would I give I think the answer is practice Um, I dabbled with broadcasting when I was a teenager and it's not easy and it was through actually unconscious practice in my case it was doing other jobs that actually um, meant that you didn't broadcast but dealt with actually remarkably parallel skill set it was dealing with difficult questions from difficult people in the area in my case of public relations and media relations Um, 
and it was thinking on your feet it was having to think about what you were saying it was having to be aware of what you were saying even before the words came out of your mouth it's those kind of skills that mean that you don't find yourself running out of steam you don't find yourself running out of words you're able to put together cogent arguments you're equipping yourself with knowledge it's just it is quite difficult to get to the stage where and i hope i manage it that what you're doing is trying to be entertaining trying to be engaging at times trying and failing to be funny mm-hmm. um but doing that whilst engaging people with information that's relevant to their viewing experience um a couple of people have asked me this question and the answer i give them is practice you can mm. the, the great thing about these these skill sets is you can practice them yourself mm. you can actually commentate on a race you're watching turn the sound down and commentate on it and then listen back to it and aside from the the, the reality of the fact that none of us really like hearing your own voice and it's quite embarrassing to do that ask yourself the question ask a trusted friend was that any good was mm. it any good was it interesting was it engaging was it embarrassing what was it um, and if the answer is that they think you've got something, go knock on a few doors. I mean, it's the old school answer, but things like hospital radio stations are great for this. Mm. You know, where there's the opportunity to go and volunteer and do some good and hone a skill set and learn and probably listen to people who've done it for years and take their advice on board and, for the most part, take their advice on board and act on it. You know, sometimes people just like to hear the, the sound of their own voice and maybe ignore those. But, you know, the, the reality <laughs> is that, you know, most of us know the difference between good and bad advice. And I'm afraid it's like a lot of things. Shouldn't expect that, and I still don't, by the way, that someone is going to kind of pick up the phone, uh, and they don't do that either, um, uh, to basically say, we think you're absolutely marvellous. Here's a million quid ticket on a business class flight to... Uh, Fuji and cover you know the World Endurance Championship believe me it isn't like that Um, it is hard work you need good people around you that spot something including enthusiasm and the willingness to work on feasibly large uh, long hours and travel long distances for you know reasonable amounts of money but not life changing amounts of money but don't expect to do what a lot of people are afraid do expect to do now and come in on a high level Mm. you've got to prove yourself quality pays off and people do notice and prepare practice offer your services on a voluntary basis if that's what gets the off the ground engage with people that you think might give you better advice to actually climb that ladder i'm happy always to talk to people on that front and do often um and then go and prove it Mm. go and prove it put together a kind of a, a demo tape and don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed to kind of say to someone can I just send you this sound file and you can have a listen and tell me whether or not A I've got anything B you're interested C whether or not it's worth a conversation mm. there are plenty of people that are in your position Graham who will um, give people opportunities to sit down and talk about advice yeah. and take it and don't be afraid to be criticised in something no. you're doing take the criticism and learn from it never give up on, on improving your skill set just always push forward I mean I didn't expect that I'd be doing this podcast as recently as about four months ago and it's been a real learning experience yeah. for me I, when, we, when we did I, I know I know I'm terrible <laughs> <laughs> but the first time we did this compared to now is, is a huge difference and a part of that is because I've gone away since I started doing this and do you listen I've, to yourself yes I've listened to okay. practically everything I've done on the Marshall Pro podcast over the past few months and I've gone away and talked to people who are like Johnny Palmer that we work with closely. He had a like terrible to- year yeah. a couple of years ago. He had a terrible year. Um, people like Toby Moody to get their opinions on stuff, ask them for opinions on it, give me some advice, just get talk to as many people as possible because they'll all have something different to say and it'll all be valuable in some way to you. Um, so, yeah, just take advice when you can get it and push on. And, absolutely right. Yeah, and don't be afraid if it doesn't... You, you can't just win you, a job like this in five minutes. If you're passionate people notice but remember there's a difference between being passionate and being obsessive you know and and do give people the space to say i've not got the time to answer that question it's not a personal insult it's very often because people are phenomenally busy in this business you know use 
you know, any content you've got wisely and use it generously. And what I mean by that is give people an opportunity to uh, to come back to you maybe a week, a month later. Um, don't be afraid to just gently tease along to say, I'd really value that, uh, that opportunity. Um, and don't be insulted if that's not the top of their priorities. If you, know, if you want it and you're good enough, generally speaking, someone will give you a shot at something. Hmm. I mean, we've been at this podcast for a while now, and we've got to be up pretty early in the we morning. Have. So we will take one more question. And I really like this topic, but it is a little bit of a rabbit hole. But it's a great question. This is from Kiwi Chris. He says, howdy chaps, reporting from last week at Gigi's behest. Um, in light of someone from our Reddit community having an article published on your website, I wanted to ask a really general question. What makes a good journalist? How has journalism changed over the years? And how is it hard not to fall into the bad habits that other journalists seem to? I think it's a matter of just, I mean, to a degree, we're going to have two very different perspectives on this one, I'm sure. And it's a generational thing. You know, I come from a generation where social media didn't exist. I worked in PR in a generation where social media didn't exist and now you know i operate in an arena where social media is absolutely the defining factor about a range of things including how quickly you turn copy around the the kind of quality of the stories that are actually kind of going forward etc so there's there's that that's come forward it's a source of irritation to me that that has led to a degradation of what i would call news value that basically the only value that's applied is can you be first can you get that information in front of whatever the audience might be whether or not that's dozens hundreds or millions um quicker than the other guy down the road and that in some way is a mark of high-fiving around whatever office you've got um i don't see that as successful I don't see that as being high quality. I don't see that as the reason to do it. And it's a shame that, unfortunately, that is rewarded by the marketplace in terms of the the numbers that are now all important. Um, it's a source of regret to me that that leaves less space to do the higher quality work. I mean, I'll give you a great example of it. I mean, you know, we here in Barcelona, uh, some little while ago, Stephen, you asked whether or not you could take a look at the last time we were here at Barcelona, and it was just some 10 years ago. You wrote a brilliant piece with it, got on the phone, spoke to a number of people involved in that race, got a piece that I'm sure that if you look back at it uh, today, tomorrow, in a year's time, you'd be proud of, um, but you don't get the space to do that often enough. And uh, for, so for me, it, it is about, if you're in the news market, you have to invest a lot of time in the immediacy, in the immediacy of news, and try to avoid the asinine efforts that in some way, I don't know, 15 kilos on a Corvette is, you know, it's, it's equivalent to the Titanic sinking. Um, it isn't. Um, and and I, I regret the fact that we, we are now in a marketplace in an era where all too often the majority of news journalists and news outlets have just forgotten about value. It's not the quality of the story anymore mm. that matters. It's the rapidity of turning that around. Mm. For me, it's a journalist, uh, the best journalists, uh, the ones who are so confident in their own ability to write and engage with people that they don't rush, they don't do anything in five minutes flat, they take the time to take in a bit something that is newsworthy or something that is worthy of comment, and instead of just writing out something and putting it straight up on the web or straight in a magazine they stand back and they talk to other people and they get more perspectives and ultimately those are always the better pieces and those are the pieces that people remember and that can be on any topic it's not just sports cars it's important i think now more than ever for us to take a look at what we read and who we read and actually take note specifically of um, specific journalists that we're reading in in news outlets rather than just um, ploughing through Twitter and clicking on anything take a look at the sources you're reading often take a look at the same story two, twice or three times on different outlets one thing that's really good is Google News um, and it's, it's a very millennial thing Google News it, and it's a bit scary in some ways but one thing it does have is an app where every major story it has a straight link to about five or six outlets that have all run the same story so you can easily see 
what sort of coverage a story is getting, and that's where you can separate the good from the the good from the not so good, should we say? I, I like that, and it's you know it's things like um, from a different era in my professional life when you know when you were dealing with often tragedy, often you know a major incident, and you'd walk into the news agent the following day, and they'd all have the same incident on the front page, but yet the number of people involved in that tragedy was almost inevitably different on a number of front pages. You know, I, I hate the moniker fake news because I think that plays to a kind of tub-thumping attitude from people who are abusing their access to the public. And that's not aimed at one, at one individual in particular. Or is it? Um, but you know, it's the, it is that thing around the news media needs to step away from a fight like that and just do it better. Just do it better. Stop messing about with celebrity and, you know, trying to influence people along a a particular agenda and get used to dealing with the facts. It's spot on from Stephen. Read the same story in different places and look for yourself to take a judgment about whether or not what is being portrayed to you as fact is actually fact or is opinion. Hmm. Is it a fact or is it an opinion? We talked about we talked about the very similar topic recently when we were away on a trip, and you said it was either your dad or your granddad used to swap newspapers with yeah. somebody um, yeah. to get the complete opposite perspective. Yeah, it wasn't me, but I remember I remember someone telling us. But you're absolutely right. all right. Yeah, no, saying effectively taking something like the Daily Mail and taking something like the Guardian and That's having a friend and just swapping them absolutely and reading the same thing twice and not being afraid to disagree no, not being absolutely. afraid to to try and understand why people think the way they do I think you know journalism is a microcosm of society and you know sports card journalism is a microcosm of a microcosm a, it is <laughs> and it very much is and I, you know I would there are things I'd urge you to look for in any story um, and that isn't just directed at the, the, the microcosm, the microcosm we operate within. It's everything. Look for where words like could and might are used. Look for those things. Read with wisdom. Read with an attitude that you are questioning the way in which the tone is used in those stories. What is the, what is the writer trying to convey to you? Is it fact? Is it opinion? Is it trying to guide you in a particular direction and ask yourself the question why and Stephen's spot on uh, be wise about the way in which you take your news and for goodness sake please never ever go down the road I'm afraid that modern society is ever more doing which is going down the, the road of tasting news that is just basically talking to your own opinion sir ask yourself whether or not there's validity in a different argument in the, in the, in the era where our news is delivered to us very often because of our social media preferences and the way in which those algorithms work. You are not going to be presented with the opposite opinion. You're simply not. That is not the way the science works. Um, it's time to fight back, actually, with that. Mm. It's time to actually ask questions of your intellect. And journalists absolutely should be no different. Um, I challenge myself every day about whether or not I'm allowing my opinions, my prejudices uh, about various things get in the way of actually what is right and what is common sense. And I'd like to think other people do too. I'm dead lucky because I've got a 15, very soon uh, to be 16 year old daughter. And trust me, she questions everything I say. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, that'll just about wrap it up, won't you, Graham? It will. And thanks again to Stephen Kilby. Thanks to Marshall Pruitt for providing the platform. And as we've said for many, many weeks now, Get well, Chabrel. We hope to see you soon looking and feeling better than we think you're probably looking and feeling right now. Um, this has been the Week in Sports Cars from Barcelona uh, in Spain, ahead of the FIWC uh, prologue that gets underway on track tomorrow with 16 hours of running. Uh, we'd like to thank again uh, the good people at Cooper Tyres and uh, the Justice Brothers for their continued backing for this and our other products. Catch up with the news behind the stories on the weekend sports cars, uh, both on racer.com and indeed on dailysportscar.com. I've been Graham Goodwin. He's been Stephen Kilby. Uh, we, and we hope Marshall Pro will be back next week, wrapping up what's been going on with next week in sports cars, including the Spa 24 Hours. Will it be good? Will it be bad? You'll hear it here first. For now, good night.